Well, happy Mother's Day indeed. And as the video demonstrated, Mother's Day is one of those days that uh, is filled with lots of emotions, right? It's lots of emotions where some of us are, are, are really happy today and others of us are, are kind of sad today for one reason or another. And some of us are feeling both of those emotions. We're, we're really happy about some things and, and a little bit down about other things. And even in today's message, I think we'll explore uh, some ups and downs, some, some laughter and perhaps even some tears, uh, some joy and perhaps even some sorrow. And so I wanted to start out today on Mother's Day by uh, just sharing with you a few uh, vocabulary terms, right? They're not going to be necessary for our, our lesson today, but just vocabulary in our culture. In our culture, we, we use words all the time. Uh, one of the words that we might use today is the word dumbwaiter, right? We have dumbwaiter. Some of you have a, a dumbwaiter in your house, but in mom language, a dumbwaiter is the one who asks if your children would like dessert with their meal. That's a dumbwaiter. Feedback is the inevitable result when the baby doesn't appreciate strained carrots or green beans. That's feedback. Full name. Your full name is what you call your child when you're angry with him. A show-off. I like this one. A show-off is any child who is more talented than mine. It's a show-off. Who done it, right? A who done it. Some people in here like a mystery, like a good who done it. Who done it is none of the children who live in my house. <laughs> And grandparents. Grandparents are the people who think your children are awesome and wonderful despite the awful job you're doing parenting them. <laughs> a couple of quotes that might make you laugh or, or, or maybe they're just a little bit more poignant. Michelangelo's mother. You ever think about what Michelangelo's mother might have said to him? Maybe something like this. Michael, how many times have I told you about painting on the walls? <laughs> Columbus's mother probably said something like this. Did I give you permission to leave the yard? And perhaps Albert Einstein's mother. But Albert, it's your senior picture. Can't you do something with your hair? And then one uh, anecdote, if you will. There's a, a mother who was walking along a, a beach and she picked up a, uh, a lamp. And, you know, when you pick up a lamp on a beach, what do you do? Well, you rub the lamp. And when she rubbed the lamp, a, a genie popped out. And she said, oh, great, a genie. I'm going to get three wishes. And the genie had sort of a, a New York accent. And he said, hey, listen, lady, I've been doing wishes all week, and I ain't got three wishes today. I'm giving you one wish. So make it a good one. And so the mother starts thinking. She says, well, wow, if I just have one wish, it's like, boy, I've been working hard with the kids, and I'm really kind of tired, and I'm worn out. And, oh, my goodness, it would be nice to... It'd be nice to go to Hawaii. I'd like to, to just go to Hawaii. In fact, I'd like to have a, a private plane. No, better yet, not a private plane because I don't want to fly, but I, I, I'd, like a, I'd like to drive to Hawaii. And, and I'd like just, yeah, I'd like to drive to Hawaii. And the genie says, look, lady, do you understand how impossible that prayer is, uh, that wishes? Do you know what we'd have to do to build a bridge to Hawaii? We'd have to have, uh, I don't know how much concrete, and then you got to have the steel guardrails, and how much steel is that, and the price of steel today? And then we got to have piers, and the piers got to go down miles to the bottom of the ocean. Like, lady, it's impossible. How am I going to make a bridge to Hawaii? So the mother kind of steps back, and she says, okay, well, if I can't have that, perhaps just, just one day of peace. One day of peace and appreciation and admiration. One day in which nobody in my house complains. One day in which everybody in my family appreciates me for all that I do. One day in which I have some me time. One day in which I get to focus on the things that, that I enjoy and I don't have to just pour out on everybody else. One day in which my husband and my children give me big hugs and tell me how much they love me. Yeah, that's what I want. I want one day of peace. And so the genie says, all right, lady, I'll grant your wish. And so he closes his eyes and he kind of looks up and he starts wiggling his hands and he says, oh, mighty powers of the wishes, grant this lady's wish and build a bridge to Hawaii. <laughs> Mother's Day is a really hard day to preach, and Father's Day is a hard day to preach, and they're hard days to preach because you, you want to come up with something a little bit new, you want to come up with something kind of uh, poignant for the, the, the specific day, 
And, and yet it gets hard to do that year after year after year. And um, so you go to the scriptures, right? Because that's what we ought to do. Just teach the Bible. Just teach the Bible. Problem is, there aren't a lot of places in the Bible where we see these shining examples of, of wonderful moms at least explained. Right? We see little glimpses of those. And so I've got one of those glimpses for you today. And I'd like to, to teach about a woman in Scripture today. But I've got to give you a little bit of background before we get there. Now, many of you know the story of Joseph, right? Joseph and his, his wonderful, colorful coat and how Joseph was sold off into slavery and eventually makes his way before Pharaoh in Egypt. And Joseph, through God's providence, rises up to be second in command over all Egypt. And, and during a time of a famine, Joseph's brothers, who sold him out, they, they come to Egypt looking for help. Now, they don't know it's Joseph who's in charge, but they come there looking for help. And while Joseph has every right to exact his revenge on his brothers, he doesn't do that. He shows compassion, and, and he offers the help that his brothers need. Now, there's more to the story, right? But in the end, Joseph says, look, I forgive you, and, and I want to bless you, and I have authority to do that. And so Joseph's brothers are invited to come and live in Egypt, the land that has plenty. Not only his brothers, but his father Jacob as well. And true to God's promise to Abraham and to Jacob to make their descendants as numerous as the stars and to grant them a land of their own, we see that the Israelites, they're, they're thriving. The Hebrew people, that's the Israelites, Joseph's people, they're thriving in Egypt. Uh, the, their, their families are, are, are growing by leaps and bounds and, and the people are growing not only in power but in stature. And, and when we get to Exodus, we read that there's a new pharaoh. A new king has taken over. And this new pharaoh, he doesn't know anything of Joseph or Joseph's God. And he starts to get worried. And he's talking to his advisors. And they get nervous about how the Israelites are growing in number. How they are growing in stature. And they start to feel like if this continues, the Israelites, the Hebrew people, will eventually take over. And so Pharaoh hatches a plan to limit their growth, both in number and in stature. And Pharaoh decides that the Hebrew people will become slaves, forced labor. And yet despite his plan, God continues to deliver on his faithful promise and in fact, what we see in Exodus 1 is that even under oppression, the Hebrew people, they continue to thrive. They continue to be strong. And Pharaoh's efforts cannot thwart what God is doing. And so Pharaoh says, well, that didn't work, so we need a new plan. We, we need to do something else. And, and if they continue to grow, they're eventually going to be a problem. And so Pharaoh's new plan is to take all of the Hebrew babies that are born... And if they are male children, they are to be executed on the spot. They're to be killed at birth. Now, many of the, the midwives, and in fact, we see two of them in, in the in scripture here, uh, who say, no, we can't do that. Not only can't we, but we won't do that. It's immoral, and we're not going to do it. And so Pharaoh said, okay, well, if that plan won't work, then I have yet another plan. And here's the other plan. We're going to take all the Hebrew male infants and throw them into the Nile River to be drowned. Genocide. And that's how we begin today's message. And as I said, Mother's Day is one of those days where we have ups and downs, highs and lows, Laughter and joy, sorrow and tears. And even today as we started with some laughter, we think about a story like this, and it brings us to tears. To think about these infant Hebrew boys that were thrown into the river to drown. If you have your Bibles, open them to Exodus 2. We're going to read 10 verses in Exodus 2 today, and we're going to focus our teaching on those 10 verses. Exodus is the second book of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Second book of the Bible, and we're going to the second chapter of that second book. 
Exodus 2. Many of you would know that the word Exodus is a, a departure. And Exodus is going to tell of a time when God will lead his people out of slavery, out of oppression, out of Egypt, toward a land that he has promised to them. In Exodus 2, verses 1 through 10, we read this. Now about this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister then stood at a distance, watching to see what would happen to him. Soon, Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the river bank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. And when the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? She asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. She said, take this baby and nurse him for me. I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the baby was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she exclaimed, or explained, I lifted him out of the water. We don't know the name of Moses' mother or father in Exodus chapter 2. But if we continue reading and we get to Exodus chapter 6, we would find their names, and their names are Amram, that's Moses' father, and his wife, Jochebed. And Jochebed is the one that we're going to talk about today. Moses' mother, Jochebed. In this story, we see that, that both Amram and Jochebed were godly people. They were both people from the, the tribe of Levi. And as, as people who were Hebrews in the tribe of Levi, that is going to become the priestly line, these were godly people. And I know it's just a, a sidebar, it's really not Mother's Day, but I do want to mention to our young men and our young women, our single men and our single women, that this is a good plan for a godly man to find a godly woman. And for the godly woman to wait for a godly man. And, and when they come together in this godly union, God will use that and he will bless that. And, and we're going to see where it's going to be necessary in this story, specifically for Jochebed. There's three things I'd like to talk about with regard to Jochebed. One is where we see uh, the scripture tells us Jochebed saw her child as a special child. Now, I know every mother sees their child as a special child. Every mother does. In fact, I was just commenting to somebody the other day, you know, when we talk about our children, especially when they're really young, and, and grandparents even more than parents, we like to talk about like how, how smart they are. Man, he's so smart, or she's so smart. And then we have them do some tricks for people, right? We ask them questions, and they answer the questions, or they do the high fives, or they give knuckles, or, and we just talk about how smart they are. And we probably all think that our children are really, really smart. And this has become relevant in my life recently because my oldest son, Grant, is now 14. And he has tried to tell me for a number of years now, Dad, I'm really not that smart. And, and I say, Grant, you are. You're just lazy, buddy. You are intelligent. You're just lazy. You don't want to do the work. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm actually not sure <laughs> at this point. He and I have been talking. And I'm not so sure. But when they're little, we just think, oh, they're so smart. They're, they're just so smart. I don't think that's exactly what Jochebed was seeing because this is an infant child. This is a newborn child. In fact, one of the things we'll know is, as we study the scripture is that there was something about Moses that was uh, very beautiful about him. Moses was a, a very handsome, well-built man. 
And, and so probably what the scripture is referring to here is that as this mother looked at the child, she noticed that there was something especially beautiful about him. And it's important for us to know that she had two other children already. Moses is her third child. She already had a daughter named Miriam. And she already had a son named Aaron. In fact, Miriam is, is a part of our story today. And so as she looks at this child, I don't think it was favoritism that she loved him more than the others, but she just noticed there was something really special about this child. And it's one of the things that I love about moms. That moms, they notice in their children that there is just something special about a child. They, they, they notice that, that this child is, is special, and not just special because he's handsome or because she's beautiful or because of any of that, but a good mom knows that the child is special because this is God's beloved son or daughter. This is the one that God created inside your womb, putting all the intricate parts together to be just exactly the way that he wanted them. So much so that he knew the number of hairs on the child's head. And he has now given this child to you, mom. And he said, I want you to be the caretaker of my son or my daughter. And a good mom understands that that, that child is precious in God's sight. A good mom understands that despite what the rest of the world may think, despite what the rest of the world may say, that God has a plan for her son or her daughter. And it is a plan for that child's good and not for that child's destruction. That God has work for that child to do. Good moms encourage their kids and let them know that I see greatness in you. I don't know what God's going to do with you, but I believe God's going to do something great with you. And I see greatness in you. My wife gets on my case all the time. Uh, we'll be married 20 years in November. And um, she, she used to, when we were dating, she would always comment about something. So in my family, there were times when um, my mom or my dad would, would make various comments. Uh, and while we were dating, they would say things like, well, you know, Rick, he, he could have been an actor. You know, and Rick could have been a comedian. You know, Rick, Rick could have been a, a professional baseball player. Uh, Rick, Rick could have been this, or Rick could have been that. And so she would often comment on, oh my goodness, your parents, they think you just could have been anything. They, they think you could have been this. They, think you, they never said I could have been a doctor. They never said I could have been a lawyer. You know, they said I could be some of these other things. And I just remember growing up that I always believed that there was greatness in me somewhere if somebody could tap into it. And that was something that my mom and dad, in particular my mom, instilled in me. So I would just ask moms, do your children know that you see greatness in them? Do your children know that despite what the rest of the world says, despite what anybody else thinks, despite whether or not they're 14 and you're not so sure how smart they are, despite all of that, that you see greatness in them? And that that greatness is something that God placed there. Jochebed saw that. I like to say it this way. Do your children know that it doesn't matter what the rest of the world believes about them? Because you, Mom, believe in them. And Jochebed knew that there was something special about this child. She didn't know what it was, but she saw something special. And if you know the rest of the story, and we'll go there today, but if you know the rest of the story, how right was she? Did God have a plan for that boy? Yeah. Was there greatness in that boy? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a second point, I think, from this story is it says here that Jochebed, she hid her child for three months. Right? She knew about the dangers. She knew about the, uh, the culture, a culture in which um, there was ordered death for Hebrew boys. And so she hid this child as long as she could. She actually protected her child from danger as long as she possibly could. And isn't that true of so many of our moms? Isn't it true that our moms, they protected us from every kind of danger? 
So often it's our, our moms who stay up with us all night long when we're throwing up or when we're, we're not feeling well. And so often it's our moms who take us to the doctor's office and nurse us back to health. And so often it's our moms who put the band-aids on and, and, and put the ointment on our bumps and bruises and, and kiss them to make them all better. So often it's, it's our moms who listen to us and help us when our hearts are broken. Our moms often protect us from every kind of danger. And it's not just the physical danger. And, and I suggest that in this day and age, it may be harder to do that than ever because there are so many potential dangers for our children. There are so many dangers out there. Uh, we, we can't even get into the whole list of them. But moms, it is so important for us to not shelter our kids from the rest of the world, but to, to hide them from those dangers a little bit. To, to be sure about what they're looking at, what they're seeing, what they're listening to, wh where they're, they're hanging out, who they're with, to, to protect them and to hide them from some of those dangers. I can tell you that my mom was probably the toughest mom that I knew in the town. And we talk about this, and, and her memory is not as good as it once was. Because we talk about this today, and she'll say to me, like, what are you talking about? Why do you say those things in church? Like, do you really think I was tough? Yes! Yes! You were tough. You were tough. And you know how it is, those of you who are growing up today. During that period of my life, I didn't like having the toughest mom in town. And today I thank God for her. I think of all the things that she hid me away from. Dangers that I didn't know about. That I didn't have the wisdom to understand. I didn't have the experience to comprehend. And yet she, she hid me away from those things to protect me until a time when God had equipped me better to, to experience them for myself. We see that in Jochebed as she hides Moses away for three months. But the scripture says there came a time when she could no longer hide him. And we don't know exactly what that means. We don't know if, if, if people started to hear that she had this child or if the child was a loud crier. Like We don't know what it was, but a time came when she felt like she could no longer hide him. The time came when Jochebed realized that she had to let her child go. And there is a time when many of you moms in here have faced that moment where you had to let your children go. And there's a time coming for others of us who haven't quite reached it yet, but a time when we're going to have to let our children go. And, and, and I'm a dad, I'm not a mom, and I'm not quite there yet, but even as my kids are getting a little bit older, I'm struggling with it. It's scary. It's scary. Now, many of you have already faced it. You maybe faced it when, Mom, you, you, you handed your child the keys for the very first time. And you let your child take that car and drive away with, without you in it. Or, or maybe, Mom, when you sent your child off to college and you waved goodbye, knowing that they were literally living on their own for the very first time. Now, I've got news for some of you. Don't worry. They may come back. <laughs> Maybe for some of you moms, it was when you very proudly waved goodbye to your son or daughter who is wearing a uniform for the United States of America. Or maybe it was when your child got married and you had to let them go to a new wife or a new husband. There comes a time when we have to let our children go. And Jochebed had to do that same thing. Different circumstances, but she had to let her child go. And in this case, it was at three months. And we can imagine how incredibly difficult that must have been. But we also know that she let her child go by setting a firm foundation, right? It doesn't just say here that the Jochebed sent Moses off, although he wasn't even named Moses at that time, but she didn't just send him off. What she did is she went out and she gathered some reeds, some papyrus reeds, 
and, and, and she put them together. And then she got some tar and she got some pitch and, and she waterproofed this, this raft. And she put the child in there and, and did the best that she could in those circumstances to create a, a, a solid foundation for the child. And, and then she didn't just put him into the river and let him float away. The scripture is clear that she put him on the bank of the river near the other reeds. So he wasn't out in the, the white water. He wasn't out in, in the rapids. He wasn't out in the deep water. He wasn't out where the crocodiles were snapping all around, right? He was, he was over on the bank in the reeds. And she did the best she could to create a foundation even as she sent her child out. And because of what Moses includes in this description, he tells us that these two parents came from the tribe of Levi. So we know that they were godly people. And I don't believe that God puts details in Scripture randomly or haphazardly. I believe that the details mean something. And so this leads me to believe that even after Jochebed sent her child out, she probably returned home and immediately went to prayer. And I don't know exactly how long it was between the time that she placed her child in that raft and the time when the princess discovered him. It may have been immediately. It may have been a short time later. It may have been a little bit longer time. But I believe, and the scripture doesn't tell us this, but I believe, based on what we know of Jochebed, that she was on her knees daily praying for her child who is no longer in her care. And not only praying for her child, but also trusting God with that child. And godly moms pray hard for their children. Daily. And they don't stop. And they have to trust God. And I know that there are moms in the room today who fear for your child because you, you don't know where your child's heart is at. You don't know if your child truly loves the Lord or if your child doesn't love the Lord. You don't know if they're going to love the Lord or maybe they won't love the Lord. And that's why you're on your knees praying every day. And yet you have to trust the Lord in this because it is only God, the Holy Spirit, who can take hold of your child's heart and draw him or her to Christ Jesus. And Jochebed, who trusted God with her child. I mean, let's look at the way this plays out. If you don't know the story, here's how it plays out. We heard that the child's sister, so the child is Moses. The sister is Miriam. Miriam stays to kind of watch. And, and that seems like a logical thing to do. You would stay and watch to see what happens as, as, as your, your brother is floating down the, the waters. And again, we don't know exactly how long it was, but she keeps a watch. And what she sees is that Pharaoh's daughter, who would be the princess, Pharaoh's daughter comes down to the river. She's going to do her daily bathing, which was not just for cleanliness, but it was also part of her, her religious devotion. And so she's a woman who very likely wants a child. And she discovers this child in the reeds. And she probably thinks that her gods have, have, have blessed her with this child. And she hears the child crying. She has compassion. She says, oh, this must be one of those Hebrew children. And she takes the, the child in. And yet Moses' sister Miriam rushes onto the scene and says, hey, do you want me to get someone to, to nurse that child? You don't have children. Your body's not in a place where it's prepared to, to provide milk for the child. Would you like for me to find somebody whose body is prepared for that purpose? And of course, Pharaoh's daughter says, yes, that would be fantastic. That would be awesome. Not only that, I'll pay her. I'll pay her. And so Miriam says, my mom, his mom, just had him a few months ago, has been nursing him up to this point. I'll get my mom, mom and child reunited. She'll nurse him and all the while get paid for it. God's plan is amazing. And this woman who prayed for and trusted God with her child is now reunited with her child. And, and as best we can tell, uh, uh, the, the, the Jewish scholars believe that Moses was probably with his mom for somewhere between two and four years. We don't know exactly how long, but somewhere between two and four years 
he got to be raised and his mother got to raise him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. By the way, if there are moms in here who, who did breastfeed, I'm just wondering if any of you would have liked to get paid for it. <laughs> and as we talk about this story, and by the way, in case you're not familiar with the rest of the story, Moses, who then is raised at the age of two, three, four, somewhere in that, that range, is raised by Pharaoh's daughter in Pharaoh's palace, learns the language, the history, the culture, is completely educated, and God is preparing this young man for something special. Preparing this young man for a plan that will play out some years into the future when Moses will become the deliverer, the leader of God's people. And, and, and I've often wondered, how did Moses even get into Pharaoh's palace to tell Pharaoh what God said, right? God's going to have these plagues, and, and Moses is going to go to Pharaoh and say, hey, God said, let my people go. And Pharaoh's going to say, no. God, and Moses comes back, let my people go. I've often wondered, how did Moses even get into the palace? Well, it makes sense that he grew up there. He has relationships. He's connected. He has access to the palace. Why wouldn't Pharaoh eventually just get tired of Moses and say, somebody take him away. Somebody get rid of him. I don't want to hear from this guy anymore. Again, there's background relationships, right? Those things exist, and God did that. He orchestrated all of that. And that's something that gives me peace. And I would hope it gives all of our moms and even our dads peace to know that God has a plan for your son or your daughter. I don't know what the plan is. But by faith, we trust in the plan. And here what we see is Jochebed, who only gets this, this brief mention in Scripture, raises a daughter, Miriam, who goes on to write hymns and become a worship leader. Aaron, who becomes the first Levitical priest of God's people. And oh, by the way, Moses who becomes God's mouthpiece, prophet, deliverer, leader, and faithful servant. You know, in the Bible, names mean something, right? When we read Moses, that name, uh, we don't know the exact translation, but Pharaoh's daughter said, I'm going to name him Moses. And, and she said there was a meaning to it. In fact, what did she say? She said the meaning was, I lifted him out of the water. And we don't know what the exact translation is or how that works exactly. But we do know that Jochebed had a name too. And we know that her name meant something. And the name Jochebed means Jehovah is my glory. Jehovah is my glory. Can you imagine when this mom is taking her child and placing him into a raft and setting him into the water of the river and at that point, she's hands off. And can you imagine how her name at that point really becomes something important when she says, I'm sending my child into the world. I can no longer do anything for him. And so, Jehovah, you are my glory. And I need you to come through. I need you to take care of him. So I did a little bit of digging. And I found out that my wife's name, Janine, that her name is actually from the French. And her name means God is gracious. I didn't know that until today. Her name means God is gracious. And as I think of my own wife, who's the mother of my three boys, I think of all the trouble that we experienced as we waited for God to bless us with children. And I won't go through all the details except to tell you it took years and it took a lot of sacrifice and discomfort for my wife for us to finally get to a place where God did indeed bless us with children. I think of all the ways in which my wife had to sacrifice her own body to deliver our sons. And again, the details aren't important. If she's listening right now, she'll remember the sacrifices that she went through as those deliveries, at least two of the three, were not real easy. 
They were challenging. I think of the way that, that my wife put her career on hold so that she could stay home and, and raise our sons. And in doing so, and you think about this, right? Raise our sons, that's a nice way to say it. Let's talk about what it really was. To, to wake up early, to change diapers 30 or 40 times every day, right? To, to wipe runny, snotty noses, to be sped up upon, to have food flung at her from a, a baby spoon and all the other stuff that comes with raising your child. And I'm not saying that it's not glorious and that it's not a joy and it's not a blessing. But moms, I think I can speak for you just for a minute and say it's hard work and oftentimes thankless or at least seemingly thankless work. I think of how she keeps her life organized. And how even today, she had to miss Mother's Day at church with her family because my oldest son, Grant, has a baseball tournament in Iowa. And by the way, what has gone on in our culture? Uh, you know, a uh, new sermon. <laughs> what has happened in our culture when we now miss Mother's Day and Father's Day and Thanksgiving and just Sunday in general and we've let all these other things become our priorities like who schedules a baseball tournament on Mother's Day? A heathen. Who said that? All right, okay. it's, it's, it's a bit frustrating and yet because of the way our schedule worked out this week and because of preaching duties and, and having two other boys with their own schedules, uh, Janine's the one who had to, to go out of town and, and miss Mother's Day to be at a, a baseball tournament as a sacrifice for her son so that he could do something that he enjoys. So there's another sacrifice. I think of our own lives and how I've worked hard to give my wife a house and in return, she gave us a home. I think of how I gave her my last name. And in return, she gave me three little people who now have my last name. And, and I'll finish today because it is Mother's Day. And I'm doing what we all should do. And I hope when you leave here, you will do for the mothers in your life. I'm giving honor to the mothers in my life. My wife is the mother of my children. And then I have my mom, the tough one. <laughs> so despite all the beatings <laughs> all the foodless nights <laughs> all the times that she told me how worthless I was <laughs> And, and you should. You should. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you something morbid. I was actually going to use this next line at my mom's funeral one day. Oh. Isn't that awful? Like, what are you even thinking about that? Well, because it's a reality of life. And, and I want to honor my parents, but I think of Little House on the Prairie, do you remember the episode where the lady faked her death so that she could have a funeral and hear what everybody had to say? And I think, why do we do that? Why do we always save the good stuff for after people are gone? Why not tell them while they're here? Paul Overstreet has this song in which he says that. He says, you know, we need to tell people today how we feel about them. Let them know today that we love them. And so, Mom, yes, I do love you. I think you know that. But my mom's name is Dawn. And, and I could not think of a better name for my mom. And many of you know her, and so I hope you'll agree with this, that I could not think of a better name because dawn is the time when darkness turns into light. In fact, better yet, the light begins to shine on the darkness, right? And, and as I think about that name and, and what that means, I think of my mom who's a woman who, who does just that. She shines light into darkness.
I remember all the times when I was a kid and I was afraid. Especially if I was in the house and it was late at night and, and I would just be afraid and, and, and something was scaring me. And, 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 and my dad worked hard and so oftentimes he would travel and he would be out of town. And so in my fear, I, I needed someone to, to shine some light on that darkness. And so I went to dawn. And, and I think of the different times in my life when I was wrapped up in my own darkness, in my own foolishness, and thinking I was getting away with something, and then she shined light on the foolishness, and she said, you ain't getting away with anything, I know what's going on. There are times to this day that I cannot explain how she found out. They just know. <laughs> She is somebody who throughout my life, and I think many others' lives too, she just sort of has this sense. She knows when, 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 when clouds loom over you, and, and she knows when, when you're just kind of gray and gloomy, and all of a sudden she'll just show up, and, and, and she'll have a ray of sunshine. She'll have a blessing. It might be a plate of cookies. It might be a dinner. It might be uh, whatever that blessing is, and she just shines light. The sky seem cloudy. She cares for anyone and everyone in whatever their needs are, even to the point where she'll wear herself out to bless others. She gives her time, energy, and self to others to make their lives better. And I'm going to guess that you know somebody who is just like that. You may be sitting next to her, you may be thinking about her right now. Perhaps she's gone home to be with the Lord. Perhaps she's just far in terms of geography. But you may be thinking about her now. Here's the cool thing. If your mom or the person you're thinking of is still with us, make time for her today. Give her a call. Go see her. And let her know what she means to you. I'll finish with this. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And here's what he says to his disciples. Now, these are, these are the ones that, that are, are the closest to him, right? These are the ones that know him, and he knows them. He says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Moms, I want you to know this. Moms, you are the lights in our families. There's a special place in my heart for dads because I think dads have a very unique and honorable and super important role in families and specifically with regard to discipling your children. We'll talk about that in June. But today we're talking about the way that God has designed moms and how moms are the lights in our families. And where Jesus was talking to his disciples, that is the ones who knew him, Moms, to be a light in your family, you too have to know Jesus. You got to know Jesus. You got to spend time with Jesus. You got to talk with Jesus. And just like a lamp is placed on a stand, that's what Jesus said, right? You take a lamp and you put it up high. If a lamp is down low, it really doesn't do much good. We have lights in this room. By the way, do you notice the lights in the foyer? I don't know if you noticed today. We had somebody come in on his own, just came in this week and redid the entire foyer. Every light out there, um, new LEDs, and so thank you for that. But we've got lights in these rooms, and the lights are always up high, right? Because you want to lift a light up. And Jesus says here that a lamp is placed on a stand. Well, today is a day for us when we lift our moms up on a stand. So worship team, why don't you come up here as I close. Moms, we thank you for all of the ways that your light has shone on us. We thank you for all of the ways that you let your good deeds shine on us. And finally, moms, we thank you for all the ways, whether directly or indirectly, you pointed us to Jesus.
that we could see him in you and give praise and glory to our Father in heaven. So moms, happy Mother's Day.